Now we're going to read together today from the Old Testament. We're reading from the book of Psalms, and we're reading from the 60th Psalm. So Psalm number 60 for the Bible reading today. It's wonderful to have a Bible, the Word of God, and to be able to read it and thank the Lord for it. So Psalm 60, commencing to read at verse 1. O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, thou hast been displeased. O turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble, thou hast broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Thou hast showed thy people hard things, thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. And that word there, Selah, means think about that. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth, that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand and hear me. God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, which hadst cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go out with our armies, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God, We shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his precious inspired word to our hearts. Please join me for a moment of prayer. Thank you. Loving Father, thy word is given by the breath of God, inspired and through holy men of God. We have the scriptures today. These are words that thou hast said. These are words that thou hast put into the mouth of thy servant David. These are breathings of God to thee, Lord. And we pray this day that as he breathed out his petition to thee and lifted up his voice in praise and thanksgiving to thee, Lord, we pray that on these two wings of prayer and praise, we too might be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. God bless thy precious word to us, we pray. Let us not miss the significance of the moment. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a very interesting day, isn't it, for the church calendar. This is Reformation Sunday. And it was Pope Leo X that said of Martin Luther that he was a wild boar let loose in the vineyard. I'm so glad that the wild boar got loose in the vineyard. We're here today because of the glorious triumphs of the gospel over the dark Middle Ages and the superstitions of that time. But we have come today to another lovely passage in Scripture where I want you to think with me about that verse that I read twice. And it's verse number four. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thy name, that it may be displayed because of the truth. And then the word, Selah. Think about that. So please join with me to think about these words. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Unfurling the banner. And I think when I listen to the announcements today, that's the sense of what you're doing in the weeks that lie ahead. 
you're going to unfurl the banner in another part of Dungannon, and through that unfurling, we are praying that there will be those who will rally to the standard and come under the banner of the cross. Well, in these days that David is speaking about, right at the beginning of this chapter, this psalm, in those first three verses, there is kind of encapsulated the condition that was prevailing at that time. Saul's reign had come to an end. It had finished in ignominy. And then David uh, came along and followed after that sometime later on. And we thank God today for David's reign. But when David came to the throne, the enemies of Israel became very active. And David was found waging warfare in the north of the kingdom against the Syrians, whilst Joab was battling in the south against the Edomites in the Valley of Salt. The outcome of both those battles was that there was great victory. But in the battle, David was crying to God for help and for deliverance. And thank God when the enemy did come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifted up a standard against him. And God caused their enemies to be smitten and disarrayed and they caused that the people of God and David and his armies and Joab who was battling on David's behalf in the south had brought about a major victory. And so the conditions that I've just mentioned and that prevailed are symbolically described in the first three verses. But in the midst of the situation, David lifts up his heart to the Lord and makes a supplication and a confession. And verse 4 becomes the triumph song of the king. And it's the language of faith. And it rings with confidence that's founded upon an unshakable and an unchangeable God. Thou hast given a banner to those that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Now, just to quickly cover the rest of the psalm, because you may not have followed what was being read or really understood it, but as he speaks, he speaks about Shechem, and he speaks about Sukkah. And they were on the east side, the west side, rather, of Jordan, whilst Gilead and Manasseh were on the west side. And then he speaks about Judah, which was in the center. And he speaks about the triumphs of God to the people, whether they are in the west of the country or in the east of the country. And, of course, Judah, the lion tribe. He speaks about their triumphs. And who do they triumph over? Well, they triumph over Moab. And God says, Moab is my wash pot, and over Edom will I cast out my shoe. And in effect, he says, I'm going to be, make Moab like a basin for washing feet, and I'm going to make Edom like a servant cleaning dirty shoes. So the Lord had the victory and the triumph in this situation. And that's really a very little quick overview of the historical background of the psalm, Psalm 60. But I want to take it now out of its context, and I want to bring it into the Lifeboat Fellowship today, and bring it to you and to my own heart, as I share with you now. And first of all, there's a striking illustration in that God speaks through his servant David and says, you have given a banner to those that fear you, that fear your name. Thou hast given a banner to those that fear thee. If we think about the history of Israel, we know that they followed in their tribal groups. All 12 tribes had a standard, and every one of them marched under a banner, under a standard. But it goes back to another time, a very special time, when the Amalekites, warring Amalekites, came against the children of Israel. And they came against them in the valley of Rephidim. You read about it in Exodus chapter 17. And it was a pitched battle. But Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill and began to intercede. And when the announcements were being given this morning, the emphasis that was placed on the place of prayer and intercession is so vitally important and so powerfully evidenced in this situation in Israel's history. 
as these three men. And you know, they're very interesting because they represent a prophet, a priest, and a king. And all three are in the Lord Jesus. And he is the one today who is on the hill. He's far ascended above all heavens. And he fills all things. And he is prophet, priest, and king. But in these three men, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, we have a wonderful picture of our great interceding Savior. And whilst they interceded at the top of the hill, Joshua and the armies of Israel prevailed in the valley. When Moses' arms got tired and heavy and they were let down and prayer began to subside, Aaron and Hur on either side lifted up his arms. But when his arms were down, the battle flowed in the advance and in the favor of the Amalekites. But when the hands of the servant of God were lifted up, the battle flow changed direction on the part of the armies of Israel. The outcome that I want to bring to you is that out of that tremendous victory over the Amalekites, there was a new name that was given to the living God, Jehovah. And that name was Jehovah Nissi. The Lord my banner. The Lord my banner. And my dear people this morning, we are here under the Lord our banner. In the name of the Lord, we will lift up our banners. We read in Psalm 20. And thank God today for the banner emblem with the armies of Israel all through their travels. There are other occasions as well that we could probably uh, draw out from the history of Scripture. But you know, our banner today is in the presentation of a person. And I'm so thankful for that. Isn't it marvelous that we are not here just saying creeds and some kind of an imaginary God, but we're in the presence of a real, living Lord Jesus. He is here. He's in the house. He's amongst us. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And as he moves amongst us this morning in the sanctuary, he sees us as we are. He reads us as we are thinking. He views us in the context of our circumstances, whether they are pleasing or painful. But Jesus is here. Amen. And I'm thankful today that he comes to dwell amongst his people. You know, I've been thinking very much in these recent days about that other wonderful phrase, the shout of a king is among them. The shout of a king is among them. And we are the people who ought to be hearing the shout of the king. And there's many shouts of the king in the scriptures, but that's for another day, unless Brother Bertie steals that thought and makes it into a sermon. But my dear people, the shout of the Jesus, the King Jesus that we worship and serve, is amongst his people all around the world today. And praise God this morning that we are a very small part of a vast host, an army that girdles the globe who have risen up to call themselves followers and soldiers of the cross. And I'm glad this morning that our ministry is about a person, someone to whom we can relate, someone who feels Someone who has been through what we have been through. Someone who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Someone who can feel for us and intercedes for us at God's right hand. There's a man up in the glory, and he lives for me, and I'm glad for that. Not only is there the wonderful banner of a person, but there is in it a proclamation of a message. And he's not just a person who feels and who touches us, but someone who has left us a message. And that message is heartbeat is in the cross work 
of this same great Savior. And I'm glad this morning that our heartbeat is in the cross work of Jesus. When Martin Luther come to a realization that it wasn't in sacrifices and offerings and in penance and on all the, re the religious exercises of his life, it was in trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And by simple faith in that finished work, he came to the joy and peace of sins forgiven. It may be that you have drifted in, and that's not the right word to use either, because no one has drifted in to the fellowship this morning. You are here by divine appointment. God has brought you here. He has brought you here in His providence. He has brought you here in His compassionate love for you. He has brought you here so that He might speak into your heart. And he has brought you here that if that's to this moment you have never been to the cross, he wants you to come to that cross today. He wants you this day to kneel at the cross. And as the hymn says, Christ will meet you there. Thank God today for the wonderful message of a person, the Lord Jesus he is my banner. Thank God today for the message of the cross, able to save to the uttermost all those who come unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no message anywhere in the world to equal the message of the cross of Jesus. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto us who are saved, the power of God. And I'm glad today that there's power in the cross work of Jesus, not only to deal with your sin, but in that glorious cross work, a triumph over all the hosts of darkness, he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a triumph of them openly, over them in the cross. And he was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. There's not a chain that Satan has forged that the cross cannot smash. Hallelujah. There's not a soul that's in bondage with whatever chain the enemy has forged around you that Jesus is unable to break. He breaks every fetter and he will set the captive free. I'm so thankful he set me free 60 years ago this year since I came into the joy of sins forgiven, since the cross work became real to my life as a young man, 16 and a half years of age, and some of you are in around that age group now, and I wonder, are you following Jesus? Now I'm almost at the end of the journey, maybe nearer than I think I am, maybe nearer than I expect I am, but my dear people, I'm glad that there's no regrets as I look back over 60 years of following Jesus and that the cross became real to me. Has it become real to you? Have you ever dipped into the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins? Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I do believe, I now believe, that Jesus died for me, that on the cross he shed his blood from sin to set me free. Yes, the significance of the banner, a person, a power, and a proclamation. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know something? If the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified, dead, and buried, and still in a tomb. There is no message to declare. But because the cross is empty, and the tomb is empty, and heaven's throne is occupied, there is a message to take to the whole wide world. 
And our song should be in that other wonderful hymn, the whole wide world for Jesus. This shall our watchword be. And I trust today that from the lifeboat, there will not only be those who will nail their collars to the mast and say, I will follow Jesus. I will be a soldier of the cross. I will take my stand for him. But there will be those who will say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I am willing. I am ready. I am prepared to go. And I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. And I'll say what you want me to say. I want my life to be all filled with praise to thee, my precious Lord divine who died for me. That's what we were singing. That's a beautiful song. Years ago we used to sing it as a family and it still resonates in my heart because that's the very heartbeat of the church to tell its message, to proclaim it around the world. There's a striking illustration. But there is also a solemn obligation. It's to be displayed because of the truth. It's to be displayed because of the truth. Truth is tied up in this whole matter. And to display the truth, that's the purpose of the banner of the Lord Jesus. The truth of the living God was involved in the triumph of David's armies. If they had been defeated, if Edom and Moab had conquered them, well, it would be a very different story because to be defeated and to be conquered was going to be the shame of the nation. But to be victorious was going to be the honor of the nation. And the honor of the church, my friends, is to be a victorious people, not defeated, not under the cause. So with truth on their side, they had nothing to fear. And thank God with truth on our side, we have nothing to fear. Truth is the anvil that has worn out many hammers. Thank God with truth on our side, there's nothing to fear. And with truth, there is everything to campaign for. And praise God today for that. And I put in my note here, our obligation has been passed on to us by many great warriors of early days. And we have become the inheritors of a treasury that has been passed down to us. Our program is going out today as it does every weekend. And this morning we were just looking to see and well, there's really quite a, an interest in what has been said and what happened for our program for today. Well, Yvonne took the message of Martin Luther and L L Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer and put those together and put it on a presentation. And people have been writing in saying how much they appreciate and what they have discovered of the sacrifice that others were willing to pay that we might have this treasure today. If you were to go to Oxford, where we've been sometimes, when Emma was living there, you would find a place in one of the streets in Oxford where there's a marker, and it was there that Latimer and Ridley were burned at the stake. What for? For the cause of truth, for the banner of the cross, for the glory of Jesus Christ our mighty Savior. Yes, my friends, it has been passed down to us at tremendous cost to others. And so this day, because of the truth, that's what's at stake, and it's to be displayed. It was Edmund Burke who said, an English philosopher, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But to do nothing, my friends, that's not in our vocabulary. It's in our vocabulary to do something for Jesus. Whilst it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. And so we do it for the honor of truth. And I'm glad today that truth deserves a bold testimony of a living Savior who saves to the uttermost. 
It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, to publish the gospel is a sacred duty. To be ashamed of it is a deadly sin. To publish truth is a sacred duty. To be ashamed of the gospel is a deadly sin. Not only for the honor of truth, but for the preservation of truth. Dr. A.W. Tozer said this, It is not denial only that makes truth void. Failure to emphasize it will in the long run be equally damaging. Unused truth becomes as useless as an unused muscle. John Wesley proved over many long years that where the temperature began to die down, where people began to lose their fervor and to cool off in their enthusiasm for God and for righteousness, that the work of God began to languish. And men and women, I don't need to tell you today that we see a languishing across our land. Why? Because truth has been compromised on the error of convenience, on the altar of convenience, And today, God is looking for people who, for the honor of truth and for the preservation of truth, will nail their colors up to the banner and say, I'm under the banner, and I'm marching in the Lord's army. You know, I was mentioning a hymn to Pastor Bertie earlier on. He said, you know, we don't know that hymn. I'm sorry sorry you don't, but you should. And it's found in the book. It's in it here. Rise then, soldiers. Rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. You know that lovely? How many know that song? Yes? Oh, there's enough. There's a quartet (laughs) right here in the congregation. Well, uh, maybe we will try it, you know, after all. Can you, do you know it? No, you don't know it? Yeah, you do it. That's brilliant. We're really, we're really going somewhere now. 413, it'll be in a little while. And we'll, we'll get it going. 412, thank you. Sound the battle cry. See the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord, for the honor of truth, for the preservation of truth, and indeed for the propagation of truth. The great purpose of Jesus Christ in choosing his disciples was that when he would finish his earthly journey, he would bequeath to them a legacy, and that he would plant within their hearts by his Spirit a love for himself, and a love for the message of the cross. And all of those men set out on their journey and lived and loved and served until they died for Jesus Christ. All perhaps except John the Apostle, who we think was maybe the only one who had a normal or natural death. They stood for Jesus They propagated the message. And in the first hundred years, the church had spread all across North Africa and was moving up into France and Europe. My friends, it was a mighty move of God. But thank God today, he's not changed. And the message has not changed. And the truth has not changed. And Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so, with a striking symbol, the banner of the cross, with a glorious sacred duty, the spread of the message and the word of truth, as you go out visiting, as you go out testifying, as you serve the Lord in the place of prayer, as you go to the college in the next weeks to come, my prayer is that the banner will fly high for Jesus, and that through you and the Lord's workings with you, that you will see much fruit for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my dear friends, we've come pretty much to the end. There is given to us in all of this a sacred opportunity, a sacred opportunity. And you know, in the opportunities that are available to us today, we are richly blessed. There are other countries where we could not do what we're able to do and free to do in our land and nation. 
You cannot do this in many countries in the world. And Christianity is underground or it's battened down by the authorities. But we have the privilege and we have the wonderful opportunity to make him known, to share him, to know him, and make him known. Think about this. Again, quoting Mr. Spurgeon, he said, There is so much in the fact of a banner being given to the hosts of Israel, so much of hope, so much of duty, so much of comfort, that a pause is fitly introduced. Think about that. So much of hope, so much of duty, so much of comfort. There is all of that in the fact that God has given to his people a banner that it may be displayed because of the truth. And at the end of the psalm, David says, through God, we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. There is a real world of difference between verse 1 and verse 12. It commences with, O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, thou hast been displeased. O turn thyself to us again. And after that intercessory prayer, after that confession, after that humbling before God and acknowledging the need of the hour, we finish with a psalm in triumph. Through God we shall do valiantly. He it is that shall tread down our enemies. We can move, my friends, from defeat to victory by being honest at the throne of grace, by being honest with God and honest with ourselves and seeking him until he comes. And then we step into the ranks and we catch hold of the cords and we take the pole and we lift the banner high for the Lord and start marching in the armies of the Lord. Are you a marcher? Are you a soldier in the army of the Lord? Are you in the battle lines today? For the battle lines are spread and set, and the battle is on, and the conflict is getting more ferocious and more acute as the king comes back. My friends, it's time to step up under the banner and say, I'll be a soldier for Jesus. I'll be on the Lord's side. I will serve the king. Am I a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause? Or blush to speak his name? In the name, the precious name, of him who died for me, through grace I'll win the promised crown, whate'er my cross may be. If I would fight, increase my courage. If I must fight, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. In the name, the precious name of him who died for me, through grace I'll win the promised crown, whate'er my cross may be. My friends, today I trust that you will be a soldier true and brave, and that this banner that's given to us by grace and by Jesus, will be grasped by us, clasped by us, to march for Jesus and say, I'm on the Lord's side. I will serve the King. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts for Christ's sake and glory. Loving Father, today, thou art looking for soldiers. Thou art looking for those who are willing to put their lives on the line for thee. Yes, Lord, you are enlisting all who will come, all who will say yes to the call of the captain of the Lord's host. And so we pray today that even in the days to come, there will be those who will step out from home and family even in the call of God to go and carry the bloodstained banner of the cross 
to other lands for Jesus Christ and for his glory and his name's sake. So bless thy word to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.